This is China Observer. I'm Daniel Hall. The South China Sea dispute is escalating once again. Chinese and Philippine warships are on the verge of conflict in the Spratly Islands. Who is behind the South China Sea situation this time? Who is really stirring up trouble, turning the South China Sea into a new war front? This struggle involves the strategic resources of the South China Sea and the interests of major powers. The presence of the USS Roosevelt Aircraft Carrier Strike Group further complicates the situation. That now includes standoffs at Sabina Shoal, United States involvement, clashes with the Coast Guard. The South China Sea crisis is escalating step by step. China's tough stance, the resistance of neighboring countries, and the strategic balance of outside powers. All of this is pushing the South China Sea towards an unpredictable future. On June 3rd, China sent the large landing ship Wu Zhishan to Sabina Shoal and conducted landing exercises nearby, deploying many fishing boats and coast guard ships. From June 4th to 5th, a tense standoff occurred again at Sabina Shoal, with ships nearly colliding and military helicopters watching from the skies. In this exchange, China's warships hold within striking distance, while numerous Chinese fishing and coast guard vessels directly engage the Philippine coast guard. This likely exerts immense psychological pressure on the Philippines. Fortunately, the USS Roosevelt Carrier Strike Group intervened, extending its presence in the nearby waters for deterrence. The Philippines Coast Guard ship Magbanua, though only 2,000 tons, has a helicopter platform and medical facilities, allowing for long-term helicopter resupplies. It remains stationed at Sabina Shoal. The incident began in April when the Philippine Navy found a large number of Chinese fishing, survey, and military vessels near Sabina Shoal. That's about 125 miles from the Philippines. Suspecting China's intention to build artificial islands, the Philippines sent Coast Guard ships to patrol Sabina Shoal's lagoon. China then accused the Philippines of illegally occupying the reef. The situation quickly escalated. By late April, China had deployed 125 fishing boats and two coast guard ships surrounding the Philippine vessels. Just 40 miles west of Sabina Shoal is a grounded Second Thomas Shoal ship, a symbol of Philippine control, despite being nearly scrapped. To strengthen its claim, the Philippines plans to build permanent structures on Second Thomas Shoal. China responded by sending many militia boats to cut off supplies to force the Philippines to abandon the reef. On May 19th, Chinese Coast Guard ships blocked a Philippine vessel from evacuating medical personnel from the Second Thomas Shoal. On May 24th, Chinese Coast Guard ships used water cannons to drive away a Philippine fishing boat. More concerning, 62 miles north between Sabina Shoal and Second Thomas Shoal, Iroquois Reef has become a base for Chinese maritime militias. Despite being at a disadvantage, the Philippines stands its ground. If they retreat from Second Thomas Shoal, they know they would be surrendering to China's aggression and losing their foothold in the South China Sea. The sovereignty dispute over the Spratly Islands involves many countries, so resolving these differences is not easy. But it is clear that the South China Sea issue is not a solo act by China and will not be dictated by the Chinese Communist Party alone. In an ideal situation, countries would discuss their issues. China should sit down with other claimant countries and work out a mutually beneficial solution. Wouldn't that make everyone happy? Unfortunately, while China participates in South China Sea negotiations, it also conducts military drills there. It's pretty clear that China is not negotiating in good conscience. More troubling, China uses maritime militias to cause trouble in the South China Sea. By creating fates accomplies, China forces other countries to concede, which is unreasonable and against international law. This makes the situation more tense and benefits no one. But at present, China does not dare to easily take action against the Philippines' eight islands and reefs. China's land reclamation, along with deployment of missiles and aircraft near the vital shipping lanes of the South China Sea, are serious violations of international law. The international community is already dissatisfied with China's actions. 
If China uses force in the South China Sea, major powers like the U.S. will step in to control China. Additionally, the small South China Sea countries will not side with the Chinese Communist Party or CCP. Therefore, the CCP temporarily sets aside direct action, using Coast Guard and militia boats to intimidate the Philippines while trying to exclude the U.S. China's negotiations with ASEAN on the South China Sea Code of Conduct are just a framework. With this code of conduct, the CCP could theoretically exclude the U.S. from South China Sea affairs and enforce the law on the Philippines, taking control of the islands. But this can only happen once the CCP is militarily prepared. If war breaks out in the South China Sea, conflicts will also erupt in the Taiwan Strait, the Korean Peninsula, and the China-India border. Chinese coastal cities might also suffer. Currently, the CCP is not ready for such a multi-front war. Despite its aggressive rhetoric, actual action would require careful consideration. Nonetheless, the CCP is certainly preparing to use force in the South China Sea. After the South China Sea Code of Conduct is established, the CCP will not wait long to use force. That comes as the U.S. and the Philippines are preparing to extract oil in the Spratly Islands. If U.S. drilling platforms arrive, the situation will worsen for the CCP, making the South China Sea battle even harder. If the CCP misses this window, it may not be able to fight in the South China Sea. Estimates suggest the South China Sea holds 7 billion tons of oil and 5 trillion cubic meters of gas. Fully developing these resources could meet China's energy needs for decades. Additionally, the South China Sea is one of the world's largest fishing grounds, accounting for over one-tenth of the global catch. The CCP deeply covets these resources. Moreover, according to Chinese nationalist narratives, the South China Sea is sacred Chinese territory. Simply put, if the CCP gives up this land, it would have to step down, which explains its aggressive stance on the South China Sea. One more piece of evidence suggests the CCP is preparing to use force in the South China Sea in the coming years. Admiral Dong Jun's appointment as defense minister. This is unprecedented. Dong Jun's appointment sends a clear signal that Xi Jinping's regime may use the navy more aggressively, both in the Taiwan Strait and the South China Sea, preparing for military action. Notably, the Chinese Navy has been strengthening its amphibious assault capabilities in recent years. Since the second half of last year, many Type 022 missile boats have been reactivated. These twin-hull boats, though lightly armored, are incredibly fast, reaching speeds of up to 50 knots, almost twice as fast as destroyers. Their shallow draft makes them well-suited for operations around the South China Sea Islands and reefs. But these small boats are vulnerable to U.S. helicopter-launched laser-guided missiles. Reportedly, these Type 022 missile boats, along with J-11B and J-16 fighter jets, have appeared on the artificial islands in the Spratly Islands. The CCP plans to use these forces to intimidate the Philippines and other South China Sea claimants, forcing them to avoid disputed areas. From a U.S. perspective, the South China Sea issue is of utmost importance. For example, consider the Miyako Strait in the north of the first island chain. It's a significant gap. Fortunately, Japan, a close ally, guards it, so there's no problem. But the Ba Shi Channel between Taiwan and the Philippines is another gap. The U.S. sees it and knows it can't leave this place undefended. So it quickly brings in the Philippines to fill the gap. Otherwise, the entire first island chain would be breached, and U.S. military bases and deployments in the Pacific would be threatened by China. If that happens, the South China Sea would fall under complete PLA control, becoming China's backyard. 
To help support the Philippines, the U.S. has invested a lot. First, they improved joint combat capabilities. They integrated the Philippines into the U.S. command system with back-to-back -back military exercises. Recently, on June 3rd, U.S. and Philippine Marines conducted their fourth joint drill this year, focusing on air support. When the front line spots enemy targets, they report to command, which immediately sends planes or other firepower. Simply put, the Philippines calls out the targets and the U.S. handles the fighting. Under U.S. guidance, the combat capability of the Philippines' military has improved daily. In the latest exercise, they performed excellently and even managed to sink a ship. This joint combat aims to make the Philippines a key player for the U.S. in the South China Sea. But having only the Philippines is not enough. The U.S. plans to re-establish bases in the Philippines. The 7th Fleet based in Yokosuka will be the right hook, and new bases in the South China Sea will be the left hook. That way, China will have a hard time making any moves in the region. Since last year, the U.S. has been rebuilding small bases in the Philippines. These bases are not just for show, they are quick response platforms. When needed, the Marines, equipment, and intelligence facilities will be ready for action in the South China Sea. This is a strategic move by the U.S. to limit the Chinese Navy's operational range. Look at the recent RIMPAC exercises. From 2018 to 2022, the U.S. and its allies have improved their combat skills and joint operations year by year. This year's focus is on validating U.S. combat concepts and coordination capabilities. All this is in preparation for China's military challenge in the Western Pacific. China is aggressive in the South China Sea and was unreserved at the Shangri-La Dialogue. The new Chinese defense minister bluntly stated, China's restraint on infringements in the South China Sea is limited. Shortly after, the Guangdong Maritime Bureau announced live fire drills in the South China Sea for July. This is not restraint, but escalation. In response to China's military threats, Philippine President Bongbong Marcos stated, The Philippines will never attack first, only defend. But he also criticized China's Coast Guard for being brutal and inhumane, and for blocking the evacuation of sick Marines. It seems the Philippines is determined to confront China. The South China Sea issue has become a global focal point. Swedish Defense Minister Peter Hulkvist publicly stated that China's actions in the South China Sea could affect the safety and openness of international shipping lanes. Sweden's concern as an external country shows that the South China Sea issue is about world peace, not just China's interests. Even more worrying, China is not only militarily aggressive towards neighboring countries, but also uses the Coast Guard and Navy under the guise of law enforcement and anti-smuggling to board foreign ships. They escort Chinese fishing and merchant ships from the first to the third island chain, boarding foreign vessels along the way. This gray zone tactic further advances China's illegal sovereignty claims. Facing China's pressure, the U.S. won't stand idly by. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin held a meeting in Hawaii with defense ministers from the Philippines, Australia, and Japan to discuss countering China's provocations in the South China Sea. The U.S. and the Philippines then focused their drills on island seizure and island defense, clearly demonstrating their resolve to counter China. To enhance deterrence in the Western Pacific, the U.S. plans to conduct missile defense exercises twice a year for 10 years in Guam, starting this October. It will be targeting Chinese missile threats. They plan to launch SM-3 interceptors from Anderson Air Force Base, simulating interceptions of incoming medium-range ballistic missiles over 800 nautical miles east of Guam. This preparation signals a worst-case scenario for South China Sea tensions. South China Sea countries do not recognize China's Nine Dash Line. Some scholars have countered the claim that the South China Sea islands have always belonged to China. Historical evidence suggests that Malay Polynesian ancestors of Filipinos, Indonesians, Bruneians, and Malaysians were the first to discover these islands. They fished in the South China Sea and the Pacific thousands of years before the Chinese. 
Bill Hayden is the author of the book The South China Sea, The Struggle for Power in Asia. Published in 2014, Hayden argues that all South China Sea claimants, including China, lack historical evidence for their claims. Hayden believes that the South China Sea was historically an ungoverned area, mainly occupied by fishermen and pirates. It wasn't until the early 19th century that the British Navy documented the existence of the South China Sea Islands. To him, the Chinese names for these islands are just a tribute to British naval pioneers. But actual occupation and control matter more than history. Veteran U.S. diplomat Philip Davidson says the key to sovereignty over the South China Sea Islands is not legal arguments, but actual occupation and continuous human habitation. China is a latecomer, which is why Beijing has been conducting massive land reclamation projects. In 2016, the Philippines sought international arbitration over China's 2012 occupation of Scarborough Shoal. The tribunal ruled that China's Nine Dash Line claim has no legal basis and that its island building activities violated the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS. The ruling also found that China's activities harmed the environment and interfered with Filipino fishermen's traditional fishing rights. China rejected the ruling, but it drew significant international attention and increased diplomatic pressure on Beijing. The legal victory strengthened the Philippines' legitimacy in the international community, but China, being a major power, continues to intimidate and escalate tensions in the South China Sea with military threats. Recently, the Philippines is considering another arbitration case to push for the enforcement of the 2016 ruling and further clarify its maritime rights. If a new ruling again supports the Philippines, it might prompt the U.S. and other external powers to increase their involvement in the South China Sea to counterbalance China's influence. Other claimants like Vietnam and Malaysia might also be encouraged to defend their rights more vigorously and even seek international arbitration. This would further highlight the international and complex nature of the South China Sea issue, putting more pressure on China's unlawful actions. Beijing continues to implement rules that violate international law, including recent policies on detaining foreigners allegedly intruding into its waters. ASEAN Coast Guards agreed to establish a set of rules to form a common norm to counter China's arbitrary actions. At the ASEAN Coast Guard Forum held from June 5th to 8th, a draft of the Sea Peace Agreement was discussed. The agreement aims to establish a common norms for Coast Guard operations based on UNC LOS and international maritime organization conventions to resist China's arbitrary actions. Coast Guards from all ASEAN members, except Brunei, and East Timor participated. Four members agreed to further review the proposed draft to fully advance it. ASEAN countries working together show their determination to defend a rules-based international order and open new paths for a political solution to the South China Sea issue. If China continues to act unilaterally, it will face widespread condemnation and isolation from the international community. Mm -hmm.